removing abandoned commercial fishing gear, gathering data by surfing, and catching invasive species. These are some of the ways people are saving our decimated oceans. Meet the deep blue defenders taking care of our marine biodiversity. Our journey takes us to Costa Rica, more specifically, Tortuguero, to witness the yearly hatching of baby sea turtles and meet the people protecting them. We arrive by way of La Pavona, a small port town with one restaurant and a pay toilet. Our boat operator, Jairo Guzman, takes us down the Lucky River. It is a one hour journey to the island itself. The view is beautiful. Nearly all species of sea turtles are endangered, and this island is a prominent nesting ground for both green and leatherback sea turtles. It was here in 1959 the very first sea turtle conservancy was opened by Dr. Archie Carr to specifically study green sea turtles as they were nearly extinct. This was their original base. This is their new base. Along with us from the conservancy is Jaime, head field director. David, station manager. Uh, estamos listos. Corto y cambio. Sylvia, outreach coordinator, and their 10 research assistants. They all work here to educate the public and gather data on the current sea turtle populations. On day one, we meet in the middle of the night to count nesting turtles and the eggs they lay. Now let's go to the beach. Around dawn, we spot a turtle. She is laying her eggs. She is one of 36,000 turtles nesting this season on the beach. Each turtle will lay around 110 eggs. In two months, they will hatch. We get some sleep, and that afternoon, we ask Jaime about the hatchings. Take one. He says, The best time to catch it is right at dawn, around 5.30 in the morning. That means we have some downtime on the island. David invites us to his makeshift office. We discuss the vision of the conservancy. Basically, we are working here on the legacy of Dr. Archicar. He had this idea of changing the mentality of the people from harvesting the turtles for their own consumption and for making money out of the meat and the eggs into an ecotourism-based uh, culture. It's a very complex thing to protect the turtles. On day two, the alarm goes off, the team gathers, and we head to the beach. We are gonna need a bigger boat. For a while, we see nothing. And then, baby green sea turtles begin making their way to the ocean. Only 80% will make it out of the nest, and of those, one in 1,000 make it to adulthood. This means that out of nearly four million hatchlings this season, only around 3,000 will become adults, and the odds are stacked against them. There is more downtime. On our final day, day three, we go to the beach to excavate a hatched nest. The research assistants do this job. It is messy. They're counting how many eggs have hatched. In this nest, nine did not make it. They'll add this information to their decades of existing research. That afternoon, Jairo's father, Guzman Sr., picks us up. As we leave Tortuguero, I can't help but think of something Sylvia said back at the base. La isla de Tortuguero es muy importante para las tortugas, pero también las tortugas son muy importantes para la gente que vive aquí. Son un recurso muy importante que tenemos que conservar y tenemos que proteger. Sea turtles are not going to stop being endangered this year and they probably won't stop being endangered next year either. But it's good to know that there are people out there working hard to make change happen. Roughly every year, 360,000 tons of fishing gear is lost in the water. Even though they're abandoned, they are still catching animals, and I was always appalled that nobody was doing anything about them. My name is Kurt Lieber. I'm the president and founder of Ocean Defenders Alliance. We get volunteer divers to remove abandoned commercial fishing gear. So all the nets, traps, and lines that are out there, they're still killing animals. That's what we focus on removing. 
Typically in a year, we will have 10 to 12 whale entanglements from this fishing gear. Over the last four years, that number has climbed from 12 roughly to 72. So it's getting worse. Our main focus are abandoned lobster traps. These lobster traps and crab traps have lines attached to them and the line has a surface marker buoy that goes to the surface and a boat comes along and cuts that or it, it gets moved around in the storms and the fishermen can't find it. They don't leave them behind just for no good reason. Be prepared to move fast if I need to push this off. Our expeditions are pretty chaotic, I'd have to say. We start out early in the morning with usually six divers. It's really difficult to locate these traps because obviously you can't see through the water. It's like a hunt and peck kind of uh, thing and it's not cost effective, but when you're talking about life, does it matter if it's cost effective or not? Not in my eyes. I get them out to a site and we drop anchor. Say they come across a trap, they attach a lift bag to it. The lift bag then goes to the surface with the trap attached to it, and then we put it on the hoist. Clear? The oceans have been really decimated over our lifetime. I'm a fighter. I will go down fighting, and most of my volunteers feel the same way. I don't know if I'm making a big difference in the overall scope of worldwide problems. You can only tackle so much in your life, and I'm doing what I can personally. When you get down there and see the impact that you're making locally, that's what keeps us going. You get mixed emotions when you're out there hunting the linefish. A feeling of accomplishment because you're actually making a difference. A feeling of competitiveness because the fact that, in my case, I'm trying to be Florida's linefish king. Linefish are a non-native species to the Atlantic, the Gulf, and the Caribbean. Because they reproduce at such a high rate and have zero predators, they are currently taking over the waters here. Lionfish eat basically everything that we eat, which includes crabs, lobsters, grouper, flounder, anything, you name it, they're game. The scary part is, is that we don't know how many of them are out there and it's probably a lot bigger than we ever will know because of the fact that we always dive the public spots or the private fishermen spots. But, I mean, the ocean is huge. The Lionfish Challenge is a contest set up for those of us that are making a difference to go out and kill as many lionfish as we can over the next four months. Not every person is a big fan of spearfishing, but the problem that we have with the lionfish these things need to be eliminated, every one of them. And whether you're a big fan of it or not, this is just not about spearfishing, it's about taking care of our ecosystem and making sure that everything stays balanced. Being crowned the Lionfish King would, will be a huge accomplishment, but it's not just about that. The next weekend, I'll probably go out and do the same thing again, even though the competition is over. To be able to be doing science while you're out there on a surfboard, surfing down the face of a wave. It's just such a fleeting moment, it's incredible to actually be able to do it. Smartfin is a surfboard fin. You clip it on the bottom of your board, you go out for your surf session. It has technology that measures ocean pH, salinity, ocean temperature, and very detailed wave characteristics. So there will be an enormous amount of data. The reason these parameters are important is because they are shifting directly as a result of climate change. We have detailed information about the deep ocean, but very limited, accurate information about the near shore. Satellites can't be really accurate with data in that narrow zone. And the other way is ocean buoys, and they're just not deployed at the coast. Bingo, SmartFin can fill that gap. Collecting oceanic data is a very time-consuming, expensive process. This is like, you just need to know how to surf. The data moves from your fin to your phone via Bluetooth, and then from your phone it goes up to our servers where everything's processed. I had to develop sensors that don't affect the surfboard. 
Nobody's gonna surf a fin that is not a standard foil. Aside from that LED right there that's blinking that tells you that there's like some sort of technology in there, you wouldn't know the difference. So we've got a test tank set up now and we're just trying to look at the precision and accuracy of the um, instrument itself. Things are looking pretty promising. As a scientist, it's pretty exciting to be able to get data over these different time and space scales. I mean, the fact that you can go out and surf and contribute to understanding what's actually happening out there is incredible. I'm not a surfer. I know nothing about surfing. I know I look like a surfer, but um, I'm not. Surfers are very influential and care deeply about the environment and want to be talking about it. So SmartFin is just a tool to do that in a more concrete way. Hey everybody, my name is Drew Beebe and I'm here in my terrible home studio that I've made during quarantine and I wanted to tell you about our new podcast called Great Big Story. It's got more surprising and delightful stories just like this one. So head over to Apple Podcasts, to Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcasts and download Great Big Story.